Hello everybody and thank you for joining today. This is your host Nino and in today's episode we shall be looking at certain legal affairs. Namely, at legislation of the European Union concerning corporate sustainability and thereby particularly at the CSDDD, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, mentioning also a piece of connected legislation, namely the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Now, these are two novel pieces of sustainability legislation, not the first on this topic, but bringing us new setup, more specificity and a higher degree of concrete responsibility to corporate obligations. That is, the idea is, as far as possible, to decrease just the expression of good intentions and increase measurability and public awareness of the types of sustainability engagements a company undertakes. So, let's have a little bit of an overview of the topic, but before we delve into the matter, kindly allow me to express two prolegomena. First, all of this is going to be presented merely for the purposes of an academic discussion. In no way is this to be taken to represent legal advice. And if you have input and would like to engage in an exchange of opinions, I would be more than grateful if you were to state that in the comments. And secondly, I am doing this overview purely in a private capacity. In no way has this been accorded with my employer and hence it may or may not represent views my employer entertains. So this is a purely private matter and all errors in particular and omissions are purely to be attributed to myself. So with that out of the way, let's get to a little overview of the CSDDD. Presently, as of making this video, it is in the draft state and once released, there is going to be a two-year transition period. And it does impose a couple of influential supervisory facilities, as noted here. First and foremost, <laughs> the expected supervisor is going to be the Financial Supervisory Authority or Financial Markets Authority of the respective member state unless some other authority is appointed. Now that is interesting because the Financial Supervision Authority as commonly supervising banks in the member states has a lot of experience with attempts to evade, excuse oneself from or circumvent legislation. And they will not tolerate such nonsense. Quite the contrary, the Financial Supervision Authority has commonly expressed a wish to receive proof of fitness and properness of the persons in charge with, in banks, you know, governance and financial matters, but here, of course, sustainability matters. So having such an experienced authority to counter evasion of a hard to grasp topic is certainly going to raise the effectiveness, the effectiveness of enforcement. Now, there are of course certain other instruments which then can be employed by the Financial Supervision Authority. Surely there will be financial penalties and these shall be oriented on turnover, on worldwide net turnover of a respective company group. But, these financial penalties, you know, they have existed in a lot of other laws in the past and sometimes punishments can be significant. But I believe more effective in practice will be the facility to institute provisional or interim measures. So the authority can tell you to conduct business in a certain way or to disengage from certain activities. And while the measures may be named provisional or interim, 
do know that this is likely going to have a lasting effect on the way you do business, as once you have established certain measures and started certain actions or stopped certain conduct, you will likely not change that again after this has been going on for a couple of months. Very likely, such interim measures can be used to shape business, and I regard that as the most noteworthy instrument which the supervision authority will have. Then there are a couple of other, you know, things to mention. There will be also civil liability. And that's not 100% clearly expressed in the CSDDD. But what I believe is the following. This is not to be seen as, a, as an extra punitive liability. Like it's not going to be you just pay 100 euro because you did not follow some measure without any consideration of the measure's effect on sustainability. But you will still need to prove the damages, you will need still need to prove causation and amounts, you will still need to prove adequacy, and so on and so forth. So the the procedure of receiving the civil liability payment would not be different than in other cases, but what it will alleviate, in my view, is the difficulty of finding a basis to demand something. So if you're having, for example, a company which is doing something something harsh to some indigenous people, then in the past they might be simply saying something cruel to the effect of, well, sue me. Like, according to what? I can do here this, I can do here that. Um, all of your ground will be swamped in oil, but yeah, you can't prove a thing. This is just general life experience risk and nothing to be attributed to me. You have no specific claims basis, goodbye. That will become harder. For now, there will be an explicit basis to say you did not meet your sustainability goals and this is why I am right now having this sort of mess or you did not establish proper goals. And you see, if a company is misbehaving and has a supervisory authority to, to stop and quench this misbehavior, and that authority does not act, then that itself may give grounds for suing the state. And for that reason, there will be a good motivation for the financial supervision authority to press companies into fulfilling their obligations, and that too will be driven also by the possibility of civil liability. Because if there should be a civil liability and the state does nothing to provide means of executing it, then that's a form of expropriation. It's like a form of taking away your rights to economic benefits. So that matters. But it's not just a punitive ban uh, like damage of, haha, I caught you blow more diesel exhaust into the air than permitted, so pay me something. So, so you will have to still prove how exactly that affects you. Then, interesting to note is the accentuation on the director's duty of diligence. And here it should be emphasized that directors are not only the CEOs, but also persons of similarly influential functions. In other words, it might also hit personnel which has factual influence. This is something quite established in a lot of laws, in particular on corporate ownership, that you know, if you can factually influence a company, you, you exercise a sort of ownership-like uh, effect on it. But here it is also explicitly mentioned. Then what is also novel, though novel in this sphere and increasingly more common in European legislation, is the extraterritorial application. Essentially, the European Union seems to be a little bit, well, fed up with third countries having low standards and competing against European companies while completely devastating their environment. So there will be uh, attempts, I believe, increasing by the European Union to quench this and to curtail such, such 
distortion of competition, what it really is, by demanding a proper conduct of everybody. And most civilized countries will have less issues to fulfill these requirements, but countries where nature is being robbed of its resources and people are quasi enslaved, they will have to change certain things. And last but not least, there will be whistleblowing protection regarding the affairs regulated in the CSDDD. Now, <laughs> that is actually quite, quite an interesting point to note, because I believe that this whole whistleblowing business is just going to extend and increase. It's not going to be just, um, you know, left at the whistleblowing directive, but I believe that it is going to pop up throughout new laws which demand proper corporate conduct. So pay attention to, to the whistleblowing topic as well while considering that. And as I mentioned, good intentions in future will not be quite enough, but the CSDDD demands that you decide upon and implement qualitative and quantitative indicators to actually capture performance. Like, what exactly were your sustainability aims? To what degree did you fulfill them? You wanted to plant a forest, how many trees did you plant? You wanted to reduce your plastic exhaust, how much did you do? You wanted to decrease heating costs, how did you fare? And so on and so forth. So in the future, this thing of we intend to to be compliant with environmental regulation, but frankly, we cannot tell you how we are doing is not going to be enough. And such performance is also relating to the CSRD. For the CSRD actually aims exactly at reporting that type of thing. And the qualitative and quantitative indicators shall be disclosed in the end. Like, how well are you doing? That should be disclosed. And these disclosure obligations are completed also with reporting obligations. And all of this may be seen also in relation to client requests. So if somebody wants to figure out how a company is doing in the topic of sustainability, it should be able to figure that out, which if you think of it, is also necessary for, from the perspective of the states themselves, like of the European member states. So let's say you're having some large pension fund or something like that, and it wants to know in which company to invest, you know, invest for the future, for the pension of the people working right now. Then that pension fund should not just be looking at the money, but it should also be looking to invest into companies which are somehow furthering the aims of having sustainable development. Because what advantage would it bring to you if you invest in something which is just short-term profitable but long-term terribly devastating? So evidently clients and suppliers and investors have a wish to see who are you, whom are they dealing with. And ultimately, if you are a terrible company, which is not giving a damn about sustainability, then there shall be termination rights, which can be exercised against you. So this will be an imposition of ex lege termination facilities, so that a company cannot say, well, you know, I'm not very sustainable, but contract is contract, I don't care. No, there, there shall be possibilities for business partners to end such a detrimental relationship if nothing else helps. Now, the European Commission may issue guidelines and model contractual clauses how exactly this stuff with the disclosure and the termination is supposed to work, and that reminds, at least myself, very much of the GDPR and what happened there. And realistically, this is again such a piece of Corleone legislation, you know, like I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. For even though the guidelines and the model contractual clauses will not be imposed as obligatory, and you may still decide against them and draft your own thing, everybody's gonna look weird at you if you do. So <laughs> in the end, you will have to strongly adjust your approach according to these guidelines and model clauses, whilst not really being in a position to fight them. 
because you did not get a legal writ directed at yourself, which you can then somehow impugnate and say, no, that was unjust, that is improper, unfair, counter-constitutional counter and whatnot. But it is just like a recommendation by the Dawn. <laughs> However, this also has one big advantage, which you should also pay attention to. Namely, it eases compliance. Because if you just have all of these demands of qualitative and quantitative indicators and reports and whatnot, but you do not know how to comply, because there is no model guidance, and that is something we see presently in Germany with their Lieferketten Gesetz. So their supply chain law, essentially the correspondence to the CSDDD. They, they don't exactly know how to comply and everybody's doing his own thing and everybody is sending weird requests to everybody else and it actually causes a lot of bureaucratic friction. So having guidelines and model contractual clauses is also going to, to give you an instrument as to how to comply. You will know if I do A, B, C, D, then my conduct very likely will be deemed proper. Now, as we had a brief overview of the CSDDD, there will also be a couple of words to be said to the CSRD. The CSRD has already become law, but it is still in the state of transposition in many countries. And the CSRD is not as the CSDDD one law, where you can say, hey, show me the CSRD, ah, this is this law, but it is rather a patchwork of adjustments throughout other legislation, and, <laughs> and hence a little bit, you know, of a challenge to read, because everything is references. It's like, in this law, we modify that, in that law, we modify this, and so on and so forth. But the idea of the CSRD, and that nicely matches the sustainability obligations, is to impose a type of corporate report that shall essentially be like the financial reports which companies are publishing, only it shall, disdain, uh, it shall pertain to sustainability. So as you were looking at the finances of a company previously, and you could say, ah, this is a good company because it is financially stable, now you should, al should also be able to look at its sustainability performance and you can say hmm, it's maybe financially stable but to be frank it is environmentally detrimental it countervenes social and worker rights it, it's terrible in every way so that is going in my estimation to lead to inhibitions and hindrances in doing business with such companies in the future it will be surely so, I deem, that in the future, for instance, public tenders might exclude companies which are not properly engaging in sustainability, that state institutions cannot invest in them, that they cannot be elected for certain roles, cannot get certain licenses, and so on and so forth. So I believe that this sustainability report in the coming decades in particular will not remain something like, ha, tell us how you're trying, but it will become, I believe, an influential instrument in judging the long-term the long-term value and and like societal image of, of a corporation. So you shall state the methodology and degree of achieving your sustainability goals and by what rules you intend to approach this. Reporting shall be done in a unified electronic format. That's also an interesting topic where, where in the past when you gave reporting guidelines, they were sometimes so shaky that various countries and even various provinces within a country and even various corporations across provinces could implement so vastly different reports that for the 
supervision authority, it is difficult to keep an overview. You cannot statistically immediately measure A with B. If you're having a unified electronic format, everything will become suddenly much more transparent. The reports shall be subject to external audit, just like financial reports. And, surprise, surprise, the CSRD shall also have an extraterritorial effect. Ah. Well, that's unfortunate. Ah, no. For a second I thought I missed a sheet. Well, now let us look at some details. First, of the CSDDDD. <laughs> uh, CSDDD, so as the CSDD details, yes. Um, first to be mentioned is that gold plating is explicitly permitted. That is the practice of member states to impose stricter rules than uh, the directive is requiring. And from my perspective, this whole gold plating business is going to be totally used to turn this directive in the future into a regulation. They're going to say, hey, look, these and these member states imposed stricter rules. Hey, it looks like it's working. And now we are not having any more um, a level playing field in the European Union. Hence, we will have to release a regulation which is going to lift everything at this higher standard. So this gold plating is going to be interesting. And it is going to give you a little bit of headaches because you cannot assume necessarily that what is enough in one country with regard to the CSDDD will be enough in other member st states. The, as a motivation of the CSDDD, the European Commission explicitly has stated that distortion of competition due to fragmentation of standards and rule sets across sectors and markets. And yeah, that this is in fact a classical motivation for regulation. And it is indeed also the reason for the extraterritorial effect. And yeah, what is the CSDDD all about? It is considering resource use, pollution, biodiversity, climate change, social standards, equal pay and opportunities, inclusion, prevention of harassment, equal treatment, anti-corruption, and so on and so forth. So it's not just about the environment. This is sometimes a mistake people seem to make, that it is only an environmental thing, but no, it's actually a sustainability thing, which has a strong social component. So if you're having, you know, an all-male company, questions certainly might arise. Hmm? How that happened, you know? <laughs> like you're having a hundred people, they're all guys, why? And, and therefore, even if you're environmentally oriented, environmentally supportingly oriented, if, if you do not meet the social standards, if people have to work like 10 hours a day or 15 hours a day on average, yeah, well, that then, then you might have other issues. So, you could say these are the three main blocks, therefore, environmental issues, social rights, and fair working conditions. So, you're having the general planet things, you're having the general society things outside the company, and then you're having the social issues or working affairs inside the company as foci. Regarding what to put the emphasis on, the European Commission has turned itself against a sector-oriented approach. So it's not going to be particular regula regulations for this sector, particular regulations for that sector. This is just going to splinter everything. Those sectors are going to be seen as important. And nor are they going to go just for the employee count. A company may be large, but beneficial. Like that is going to be a large employer. So there's nothing against the employee count. Though it is an important criterion to indicate the power of a company, most importantly is seen the turnover, also the thing on which penalties will be later based. And this time, there shall be again proportionate measures and easements for small and medium enterprises, something the European Union famously sort of missed in terms of the GDPR, causing a lot of uproar across the industry because somebody who, you know, lays tiles has to 
follow the same data protection rules as someone who is professionally collecting data as a huge company. <laughs> so this is not going to be quite like that. <laughs> and here you also see some of the stricter measures now adopted. There shall be periodic reviews of business relationships at least once a year. And there shall be amelioration efforts if you find something like some business partner, which was fine in the past, has suddenly engaged in dirty oil drilling or exploitation of workers in some third world country or something like that. So if, if you cannot persuade that partner to disengage from such activities, then in the end, you shall have the option to terminate the relationship. In fact, that is the desired outcome if negotiations to, to a mutually beneficial solution and the respect of sustainability goals turns out to be impossible. Now the rules shall be applicable to companies with over 500 people and over 150 million euro worldwide net turnover, or and here comes the sector specificity <laughs> of a size of over 250 people and over 40 million euro worldwide turnover like comp co company groups, if such turnover is generated in certain higher risk sectors. So this is, you cannot splinter it across 10 companies because they're just going to count that all together and see how big you are. Now, the member states shall ensure or shall make so that companies ensure an integration of due diligence regarding corporate sustainability into their internal policies. So it's not like we all wish something, but it's not regulated anywhere. Adverse impacts shall be identified. So it shall not be just like, ah, oh, we're generally caring about the planet, but what specifically are you doing that might be that might be an issue? Measures of prevention and mitigation. Like you can say, I don't know, our company is professionally doing the electrolysis of ore in order to uh, attain metal, then that's going to use a lot of energy. So how are you handling energy in your company? You shall establish also a complaints procedure hmm, that harkens back to whistleblowing, also GDPR and a couple of other such laws, also the data services that, uh, regulation and, and so on and so forth. So... You, you shall give in you individual some form of of rights to to address the company. You see, this is something, by the way, if you allow me a so short excursus, which is distinguishing democracies from totalitarian regimes, in that totalitarian regimes oftentimes give you all sorts of rights on paper. But what you completely lack is any subjective fashion of exercising that rights. So, you have a right to free speech, but you cannot complain to anybody if it is somehow curtailed. So, while on paper they look awesome, in practice they are terrible. And in order to prevent that, there shall be a complaints procedure established. And the effectiveness of the due diligence measures shall be, uh, of the, shall be monitored. So, you cannot just say... Yeah, I made one something seven years ago. I don't know how it's running, but no, you should you should look at it. And that likely is going to be also connected to the reports you're supposed to do. And finally, there shall be public communication of the due diligence performance and efforts. The company should also have a proper code of conduct regarding sustainability, which shall be updated annually. It also means no change, but you cannot just let it be in a drawer for the next 10 years. In it, you shall describe your approach to due diligence as a company, the processes to implement it, and the application of your due diligence aims to business relationships. Uh, this is definitely something where I expect a lot of intercompany bureaucracy, because everybody's going to draft up his own code of conduct and everybody's going to send it to everybody else and demand that the respective other party complies and the other party will say no no we have our own code <laughs> so that's gonna be fun and and the only thing which is going to you know sort of bring order into this sort of chaos is if you have guidance or model clauses so 
Then you shall also have a prevention action plan. What exactly are you gonna do to prevent sustainability malfeasances? And it shall have timelines. So during the period between November and March, no more than so and so many kilowatt of energy shall be expended for the cooling of the meat production facility or whatever like you are supposed to have something with timelines with specific qualitative and quantitative indicators in order to verify whether that what you're so nicely talking is just some sort of sugar talk or serious business and you shall seek contractual assurances again a lot of intercompany bureaucracy to be expected here so that your sustainability goals are met. But that means, of course, that you're trying to make other parties follow your aims. And that's gonna go interesting in the practice. And there shall also be verification means. Like, I told my partner to only supply me with clean energy. Well, did the partner do so? Did you check on it? Did you demand a list of the composition of energy by kilowatt hour or percentage so that you can somehow measure this. And adverse impact must be brought to an end. Well, here you are first supposed to talk and then supposed to leave. So essentially, <laughs> yeah, if um, good cooperation is not possible, then you shall first try to suspend the relationship as a sort of warning and then you may ultimately terminate the relationship. And I believe that this whole suspension business and payment obligations connected to it are going to, to cause a little bit of headaches for, for some entities. Because you see, if you are in a state of suspension, it means that certain solutions that you are procuring still cannot be entirely dropped. It's not like in termination. So let's say that I'm supposed to supply you with milk and you are not satisfied with the way I'm storing it and you suspend the relationship because you're saying I'm having old-fashioned cooling facilities, everything's leaky, um, lots of energy is wasted, so you're suspending the milk supply and you don't want me to supply you with the milk. Then what am I going to do with the milk? You know, it's a suspension, it's not termination. I may try to somehow sell it to someone else, but what happens if tomorrow you come back and lift the suspension? So <laughs> this suspension thing is going to cause, it's going to cause some discussions in negotiations, I believe. Now, all of these things I am going to mention here are going to have the effect of increasing customer requests and are going to likely cause some degree of need to adjust the way of doing one's own business. So this is all going to practically affect you, I believe. You shall be monitoring the indicators with some form of consequence. It cannot be a no consequence monitoring, right? There shall be a complaints procedure, including meeting with representatives. So if somebody says, look, you're spilling oil and I want to talk with your CEO about that, then maybe the CEO doesn't have to come, but the CEO has to send someone whom she is comfortable with to address the issue in the future. Simply denying such a meeting, simply ignoring the complaint, might bring you closer to punishment and liability. And not only do you have to meet, but you have to provide a follow-up. We met, we talked, and then look what we did. That strongly harkens back to the whistleblowing directive where the whistleblower also has to receive a follow-up on her or his report. So if you somehow ignore that step, I think you're, you're totally facing whistleblowing and reputational risks. Like if you avoid the meetings, if you avoid the follow-ups, somebody might say the world has to know. There will be 
commission guidelines and model clauses, as already multiply mentioned, and you know, they can't just release a thing and you ignore it. Likely you will have to practically adjust your way of doing business and your way of contracting to these two things. But what shall also be useful is that member states shall supply websites, platforms or portals where you can attain information on how to comply with the sustainability requirements. This is even more Corleone legislation, so to say, because if your member state, if your European member state is publishing something on a website of what is expected for you to do, then you cannot simply ignore that either. And, and again, that will influence the way you do business. Now, sanctions are not exactly specified, but they shall be based on turnover. And you see here, with sanctions based on turnover, past practice from other laws may translate into the amounts due. So if you're having some administrative practice that common first-time offenders are getting something like 10% of the top fine, then if the top fine is high, so will be your first-time payment. And if this fine is based on your turnover, uh, then you get substantial fines, so that it's not just fines for the poor, right? If you're having fixed money fines, they are just fines for the poor, whereas the rich are allowed to do whatever they want, because the rich are just percentually ignoring that fine. Like if you, I don't know, if you find some, some billionaire uh, 200 euro for parking wrong, he, he just will park wherever he wants, right? So, then you're having that thing I mentioned as, in my view, most influential, and more so than the, the, than the other sanctions, namely the possibility for supervisory authorities to adopt interim measures to avoid the risk of severe and irreparable harm. Now, <laughs> that means they tell you what to do and what not to do. And once you're caught in that for a few months, you will simply continue, likely even if they lift their measure. Because you will not want to have it again. You will not want to have the shame twice. And you will have adjusted to it materially. And now, as I mentioned, I believe the liability is likely not something extra and punitive, but I believe these are simply parallel new grounds for a claim. And indeed, uh, the, the directive is specifying that other grounds for a claim are untouched by it. So you might actually have a claim to the same amounts on multiple grounds, but it just gives you an easier way to sue, though not buy itself an extra amount to sue for, which you will still need to determine and prove the responsibility of the counterparty in regard to it. Now, there shall also be a possibility, though, to avoid the liability according to this directive and not according to other claims basis, if you have demonstrated best efforts in regard to proper compliance. And that actually finishes our section on the CSDDD and your sustainability obligations there and de dealing with suppliers and clients. And we shall now look at the CSRD, so the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is already released by the European Union as a directive, but as I said initially, it has not yet been transposed into all European jurisdictions, and certainly not in my own Austrian one, uh, at the time of making this video. The CSRD is a successor to the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, the NFRD, and both are patchworks. So both are not uniform laws, but also in their transposition, the NFRD has also been just a spray shot across lots of other laws. And here, there is going to be now a stronger emphasis on corporate governance, anti-corruption and anti-bribery measures. Um, and, and here with regard to, particularly with regard to financial contributions, you know, if, 
If you are contributing to an environmental organization yearly payments, then maybe that financial organization, uh, that, that environmental protection organization will have greater difficulty reporting your environmental misdeeds in the future. If you are somehow contributing payments to a workers union, then maybe it will be harder for them to to exercise their right to strike against you in case you mistreat your workers and so on and so forth. So such bribery and corruption practices shall be curtailed. Um, due diligence is m more accentuated than previously, so you, you cannot just, you know, express good intentions alone. And there is now a bigger accentuation on human rights violation, prevention and other social issues performance measurement by indicators so how well did you really do in particular in term of your due diligence and again an extraterritorial effect so what are some sustainability reporting subject matters and you see how this neatly connects actually to the CSDDD well they concern climate change mitigation and adaptation water and marine resources uh, usage, pollution, resource use and the circular economy. Do you recycle things as far as, as far as possible? And you know, don't underestimate that. People do spend a third of their day at least at work. So yes, you do produce some trash. Biodiversity and ecosystems, equal treatment and opportunity. So there are also a lot of social issues, working conditions, also with regard to job security, working hours and remuneration, respect for human rights and dem democratic principles as well as fundamental freedoms, the exact role of management structures. So who is exactly doing what? Who is responsible for what? Uh, that, of course, gives you a good connection point to penalties, fines, and interim measures, such as fire this person, this person is unapted to do his or her job. And <laughs> you shall have internal controls and risk management. So not only shall you express your goodwill to sustainability, but you shall also implement something to, to check it with. There's also a fo focus on business ethics and anti-corruption and anti-bribery. Here in particular also with regard to lobbying activities and relationships with third parties. That is, these three are really forming a cluster. Whom are you doing what with? And are you percent some, perchance somehow exercising undue influence? So you can see how... This is essentially the reporting skeleton on sustainability obligations, which might be then imposed by the CSDDD and perchance also future laws and regulations and like administrative guidances and whatever else. Now, evidently being called the reporting directive, there is a strong emphasis on reporting standards. There shall be a single electronic reporting format, as mentioned already, in which there shall, and there shall also be a description of the business model of the company and its strategy regarding sustainability. There shall be identified the opportunity in sustainability affairs and there shall be made an impact assessment. Like, as I mentioned, you're spending one third of your day there. How is your energy use? What sort of impact can be made there by, for instance, by using energy saving lamps, good isolation of the good insulation in the walls of the building against thermal loss in the winter and so on and so forth. Then plans, measurements and their implementation. Uh, plans and measurement of their implementation. So you cannot just, you know, as many companies nowadays have good intentions expressions, but you shall also say, I want to do X, how am I doing X? And in this regard also come the necessity to, um, to define time-bound targets related to sustainability matters set by the undertaking. So time-bound is the relevant element here. You cannot say I intend to one day reduce, but I intend in the next five months to do X, Y, and Z. 
And then comes, of course, not only the environmental, but also the social component of sustainability, namely equal treatment, working conditions, human rights, business ethics, anti-corruption and anti-bribery, political influence, things, and so on and so forth. And again, the specific role of the management the administration bodies and the supervisory bodies, as well as what expertise is employed at achieving the defined goals. So this is all going to be part of the company's report. And you know, this public image you're thereby creating is certainly going to be a little bit of a mid motivator to do this properly. And all of this is a lot more detailed, a lot more specific than in previous similar legislation. And so companies indeed will be having the duty to describe their sustainability policies, like what exactly, and that's gonna cause again intercompany bureaucracy where everybody's going to try to impose his sustainability policies on everybody else. There shall be information on incentive schemes linked to sustainability matters. So this old adage of the directors trying to exploit the workers as far as possible because that is simply in the interests of the company will no longer be true even for such already mismanaged entities uh, because that's just not true workplaces which you enjoy just don't try to exploit you they try to help you to to realize something sensible with your life because that's i believe the general wish of every normal same person to to do something reasonable in in, in the time one spends in one's life working so you will also have to take care of all of the sustainability matters. That means also your workers' rights, their working hours, their fair wages, and so on and so forth. You can't just say profitability first, because you now also have a sustainability obligation. There shall be also a description of the due diligence process, the principal, actual, or potential adverse impacts, uh, like... What are the main things that could go wrong in terms of sustainability matters? Like, as I mentioned, if you are, let's say, a small oil drilling company, which is just operating a couple of drilling towers, then likely an oil spill is going to be the worst thing. If you're going to be a personnel servicing company, then the question is likely more regarding your staff and its um, opportunities and so on and so forth. Then what actions do you plan to implement in order to prevent, or if you cannot prevent, then at least mitigate, but if possible, in fact, remediate or end negative sustainability impact. A description of the there to connected risks and the dependencies of what will happen only if what else is happening. And here you also have a good potential for intercompany bureaucracy because some of your interdependencies may in fact concern third parties like if you want to decrease your energy footprint then that will depend on parties supplying you with proper let's say lighting or insulation or clean energy from like acceptable sources and so on and so forth so yeah that is not a purely internal thing these dependencies then what are the relevant performance performance indicators the whole thing shall be subjected to external audits as mentioned already so just as you're having your financial reports audited there shall be sustainability audits and fancy the reputational risks of that also for the auditors this is going to be more interesting because they cannot just go for financial stability now they have to keep in mind a lot of other act, uh, factors and while i know many will think yeah but these are soft factors and this will be easy to comply with i'm only saying soft yet but give it a decade and let's see how strict it will be then and then there is this real fun with the extraterritoriality. Now, if you're having a big company group with its headquarters elsewhere, then the European Union will, of course, only be able to directly supervise the entity which is acting within the European Union, right? 
Ah, well, <laughs> but it still will demand group reports. That is not only for that company, but for its entire company group. So these group reports will then have to be published by the subsidiaries within the European Union. And if you're having more than one subsidiary in, let's say, more than one European member state, then at least then it will be quite sensible that the foreign group nonetheless creates a group-wide report which everybody may use. Like, it would be pretty, pretty stupid, to be frank, <laughs> to leave this to the subsidiary to implement on its own. So, yeah, I am sure that the extraterritoriality is going to materially, if not formally, capture also large foreign groups simply due to this reporting obligation on their subsidiaries, which they might likely need in order to do business in the European Union. And that really concludes today's video. I do hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gave you a little bit of an idea of the oncoming, in, in regards to the oncoming European sustainability legislation. I hope to greet you here soon again for further videos on various topics. And I would be more than delighted if you were to become a regular subscriber and return here often. Until our next encounter, I wish you a wonderful time. Thanks again for joining today. And from me, goodbye.